Good afternoon. I'm Gail Gilbert. I'm an artist and writer. I have been a professor, a museum curator, museum director, written about 20 books on art, and creating exhibitions in eight countries and 30 states. But now I am focusing on my own creative activities. I'm sharing my art and poetry and writing as one because it is all part of my creative spirit. I wanted to start with my artist statement to tell you a little something about me. Art, be it visual or written, can reveal the soul of place and create unique expressions. It can visualize sorrow or joy while creating a dialogue about these social issues. My work aims to reveal the unique elements of a place and yet show that which is universal. It should hopefully make a viewer stop contemplate and be inspired. Using photography and encaustics along with poetry, the work becomes an installation, sculpture, a wall piece. Images are clearly visible and yet hidden, like life itself. Much of it is fleeting, changing and mysterious. Having had a career in museums and universities, I have swam in the sea of art absorbing images and ideas to now emerge as an artist writer who has things to say with my own work. Romeo Bearden, a collage artist, once told me that an artist is someone who has seen the world of art and still has something to say. With all of today's issues, I have a lot to say. So I work from the intersection of social issues and creativity, be it centering on poverty, racism, or the environmental crisis. No matter the time or place, it all comes down to the universality of the human spirit. My current body of work began in India about 22 years ago. I was in India on a fellowship for two months. I lived there and spent time with people. I saw the side that many never look at. I saw the poverty, the children. I would later be able to show my artwork many times in India, but I also write poems about what I saw. The works were photography with encaustic on top of it, some of them becoming assemblage. I wrote this poem to go with this little girl. It's called The Eyes of the Children. Her fingers were small, two hands fit in mine, her face was round with beaming black eyes. Her voice was shrill whenever she laughed. Her hair would fly whenever she ran. Her heart was filled with love. Her mind was yearning to learn. Her soul was bound with hope, for she believed in us until we let her down. Her stomach swelled from hunger. Her limbs were racked with fear. Her cries were silenced by a storm of a world that did not care. 40 kilos of flesh dumped upon a pile, left to suffer and die, but I can still see her eyes. Unfortunately, I saw these children and homelessness in other parts of the world, and I decided that I didn't want to use color anymore. I would just use black and white. Color was too distracting, it was too beautiful, and I was seeing all these things in the world and wanted to bring this out. Another piece I did, this was in Nepal, soon after the earthquake. I received a um, grant, a fellowship, to go to Nepal to photograph the aftermath of the earthquake. And for my artwork, I pho photographed many of the children that I saw. This little girl is called Silent Tears, and I wrote a poem to go with her as well. When innocence falls off the side of a mountain, how do you forget what has been? When Poochie and Papa fall away before your eyes and home opens up to the sky, when the ground keeps shaking beneath your feet, how do you stop the tears from rolling down your cheek? When you stare out and no one stares back, how can the silent tears ever stop falling? I was very fortunate to have a wonderful gallery in New London, Connecticut, and they did a one-person exhibition of my work 
You can see off in the end here, this is the full construction of Silent Tears. Each of them were built into um, sculptures as well. And uh, many of the pieces from Nepal were there, as well as pieces from Japan. I also had a grant to go to Japan after the tsunami. And I took photographs, which also often be collaged as well. And this particular photograph was then built into a series of assemblages, which are in a suitcase. So you'll notice that there's two sides to the suitcase. On the one side is facing what's happening now, and on the other side is the memories. So it's a two-sided panel, and the memories are reflected in the mirror so that you can't see them clearly, like most memories. And again, I wrote um, about it, and you'll understand why it's in a suitcase after I read this to you. On March 10, 2011, Yoshiko returned to Japan after studying in California, ready to start a job at the International Sentai in Sendai. How perfect. It was just six miles from her family home in the sea town of Gama. She never even unpacked her suitcase as she headed off to her new job on the morning of March 11, 2011. Excited, she ran out, forgetting to kiss her grandmother goodbye. Her new job was nine floors up. She was on top of the world, looking out on the city toward our town and the sea. Nine floors up when suddenly sirens screamed and the world shook. For nine minutes, glass shattered. For nine minutes, bookshelves fell. For nine minutes, she held her breath. For nine minutes, she could not move, but with cuts and bruises stumbling across the room, she rushed to the window and saw her world swallowed by the tsunami, swallowed by Ryojin, the dragon of the sea. There was smoke and sirens and people running and a wall of water destroying everything in its path. By nightfall, she made her way back the long six miles to what was once her home. Her suitcases were no longer there, nor her house, nor her grandparents. In nine minutes, the dragon of the sea had swallowed it all. This was another shot of the exhibition. And if you walked in, you had to walk onto the gravel in order to see the pieces. It's like a raked rock garden. And there was a rake there where you could repair the environment you just set, stepped on and destroyed, or you could leave it. It was very interesting. Mostly children took the rake and fixed it, and the adults didn't. And the rocks, instead of the big rocks, was debris, as you can see here. I continued on with this idea of Rio Engine, the dragons of the sea. And you'll notice that they don't have arms because it was so hard for them to protect the environment. The dragons of the sea, the Rio Engine, are here photographs, which is printed on fabric and then attached to fiberglass forms, enhanced with encaustic and um, oil sticks and paint as well. So the work is about the relationship we have with the environment. And these are the dragons in Chinese mythology that rise up to protect the river and the floods, the sea and the spirit, the Jialong, Shenlong, and Jiaren. They are the persona of the world. And I wrote this, they are the essence of the sublime, the face in the cascade. It is our relationship with the environment. We are the river, the trees, and the sea. A life to match a fearsome cascade. Smell the dirt, hear the river, taste the wind. We are the land, the tree, the river, and it is us. In each drop of water is the secret of life. Water, trees, wind are life itself. Jiren shows up in another place. I was fortunate to be able to work on an atrium in New London, Connecticut. And this atrium had was 50 feet high, as you can see here. And I placed five five foot by 20 foot panels on in the space. And they were, as you can see here, sheer. So you could see them on both sides. You could see the light coming through. 
down below on the floor was uh, images of the river and the dragons of the sea and the river to protect it were standing there. Um, there's a little video here that shows the sound of the water because there was water flowing throughout the time of the peace being there. In fact, the landlord came down one day and said, oh my God, there's a flood. And then we had to explain to him, no, 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 it's just the installation, it's the peace. This was at Harris Place in Atrium, New London. And much of this work, if anyone wants more, uh, there was a full article about it in Ink Magazine and The Artful Mind, if you want more information. I also had an artist residency in Greece, and I couldn't do full-length pieces in Greece. So be I began to do this Gaia series with heads. And Gaia is the goddess of the earth and they were later then shown in an exhibition in Greece. And some of them are coming out of the images. They're sort of molded forms. The photograph on the fabric is then molded and then placed on top of another layer of fabric. Art can do much more than capture the beauty of a world. It can profoundly impact our understanding of it. For me, it is our relationship with nature and how we protect it that is critical. I found water to be the most powerful of all the elements. It can be solid when frozen, a gas when heated, or flow is liquid. We cannot hold it, it has no form, it has no color, except when it reflects the sky and the bottom of a pond. It can be gentle, a raging river, or carve a mountain. It can devastate a town, and yet it nourishes all of us, and we need it above all else. We can survive without a home or a car, we cannot survive without water. Its life cycle is ever-changing like our own. A drop of rain falls into a pond and it moves on to the ocean. My art is meant to remind us as it reminds me each day that we are the environment and we destroy it, we destroy ourselves. I try to emphasize our role in that. In trying to find that balance in dealing with the water, um, I did this piece, which I called Dantien, and I put a little poem here that I just reminds me sometimes of our lives. Groundhogs and vultures digging for the light, while field mice try to block it with their shadows. Dantien, the piece you see here, and this is the front and back of it, is again an archival digital photograph on fabric then molded over uh, fiberglass with encaustic and wax and oil stick. Dantien, or some of you may know it as the Hara, 
is the space two fingers below your belly button. It's the source of your chi, your energy. And here you try to find a balance within that energy, within that chi. When we look closer at Dantian, you can see that she has one hand holding the water and the other hand is letting the water flow. So she's trying to balance out, in essence, the yin and the yang. I wrote this little poem to go with her. She is the promise that everything is possible and the realization of which we have no control. It's the air we breathe, the wind we feel, the smells we send, the images only your mind can see. It's a space between the energy of life, the light of a swollen heart or a teardrop, the space between the rain and the sun. It's a voice in the air, the song of a bird, as the flowers sway and the tree blossoms bud. It's a flash of lightning, the crack of wood in the fire, the darkness of the night. It's a million miles between the stars or the space between me and my child's hug. It's at the center of the womb, the nucleus of an atom, and light between each blink. It's the glint in a diamond or the space between a lobster's claw. It's the air beneath my wings. After all, Dantian is space that we create our life. But if Dantian was going to be about balance, then it needed to have what she was emerging from. And in light of the way our lives have been the last few years, I decided to paint this tsunami. And that tsunami, which starts with a photograph, it's a very large piece, and then painted on top. And she is now, Dantian is sitting in front of the tsunami, and she's sitting there trying to find the balance between the two. I was very fortunate that I was invited to exhibit Don Tien in the tsunami at the Berkshire Museum this past summer. And here's a little video a friend of mine did of the um, Berkshire Museum exhibition. And you can see her. And this is a little bit of a close-up of her as well. Some of the other pieces are more uh, freeform. So this is a recent piece um, that is created. And then you can see part of the uh, artwork that comes out onto the floor so that the viewer is supposed to stand there and confront uh, the piece and be there with it as a part of it. And I wrote a little poem that goes with it. We are but a speck on the ocean floor, the filth that pollutes the sea as it cleanses our very soul. The ebb and flow is endless as it takes us in and spits us out without a second thought, is the very source of the nourishment of life and yet has the power to destroy. We call it Oshun, Yamaya, Tara. We pray for it to fall from the sky and pray for it to stop. It has no shape, no form but can assume any shape or have none at all. But with everything that was going on in the world around it, I couldn't help but also be involved in some of the politics that was going on. So during the Black Lives Matter, I went to the protest in Great Barrington, and I took this photograph of this young woman and older woman sitting together with their signs and I was struck by the sign that she had with her, which said, white silence equals white consent. And I decided that I had to make that into a piece. So again, I printed that archival digital photograph on fabric and then created this freeform protest piece as well. And then of course, I also had to write a poem to go with it. I am white and I am privileged, but why? My heart pounds, I breathe and sigh. I gasp for air, just like you. I bleed the same, I cry. Why should I be seen any differently? You deserve health care, education, jobs, respect, same as me. But all I can do is reach out a hand or take a knee and ask how I can help, 
how I can stand by you and make them see what I see, that we are really all the same. Those people must be blind, and I don't understand why. But maybe if I stand with you, if we all stand arm in arm, we can make everyone see that we are all the same and that you deserve to be as privileged as me. Another piece that I were, wrote at that time was for all the mothers who have lost their child because when we saw the, the murders and the killing and you hear more about it, it's just so touching. As a mother, I can't even imagine losing a child. And at that very same time, a bird's nest fell out of a tree near me. And I took the bird's nest. The bird was no longer in there. It was on the ground. And I decided to make a piece around the bird's nest. And it's the first time I didn't use any photographs with it. So it's all made. The bird's nest is over here. And it's against her womb. And she's holding it up and crying and screaming um, out. Um, as she holds the bird's nest. I happened to go into um, Harlem at that time and I wrote another poem that I thought related to what was going on in the world. I took a walk today and saw the buildings that have been there for a hundred years or more that have seen the lives of those who struggle to survive. I took a walk today and saw a woman of 50 who looked 80 shuffling her long in her pink slippers with a cart full of bottles and cans. I took a walk today and saw the blind man with a smile, a do-rag on his head, and a cup held out for spare change. I took a walk today and saw a man and woman screaming in the street while another hugged and kissed. I took a walk today and saw those living on an island of poverty and neglect, surrounded by a sea of gentrification. I took a walk today and saw those high up in new brick towers perched in their penthouse sky condos who will never see reality. They never took a walk today or any day and failed to see you and me, the building, the lovers, the pink slippers, the blind man with a do-rag. So you may have seen by now there's an overriding theme with all the politics. It's about the role of the female spirit in our society. From the time she is a little girl in poverty, she dances for dinner for her family. She is the survivor that carries the memories of those lost. And she is the dragon that rises up and tries to save her environment, rising from the sea out of the waterfall. She is Gaia, the goddess of the earth. She is trying to find the balance in a world, prays for it, and yet raises a fist to fight for everyone's rights. She gives birth to the world and screams and cries when it is taken. She tries to protect us all. In that same vein, I recently discovered a kindred spirit from almost 80 years ago. Boxes were found in the house that had disintegrated and fallen in, in Otis, where I live. They held the life of Sue Moody, a woman who fought hard for her rights and those of others. I am now writing her story. Sue Moody was a food and fashion journalist in Paris as the German Nazis marched in and took it over. This is her story written using letters and journals that were hidden away in her house in Otis, Mass. It is about her struggles as a woman and finding refuge in the Berkshires. And I'm just going to read a small passage from the new book. Whistling, whirling sounds, explosions, sirens, screeching, warning us. I kind of, by the way, felt this was relevant to what's happening in Crane. The gripping fear of another bombardment never went away. Every minute I anticipated the sound of another screeching, plummeting bomb and then reverberating explosion. One day an aviator tossed five or six bombs out of his plane right near our building, demolishing, flattening homes and killing men, women, children indiscriminately. Lives that were meant to be lived, young men and women and children. Lives that had struggled with intimate and happy moments during normal times working in offices or farms for their children, bringing home presents and treats, flowers for the mother as they saved up for a new used car vacation, the father admiring the new green jacket mother had bought for his daughter, lives not yet fully lived. These were the people that in the flash of a moment had killed by the bombs. I knew that I had to survive, I had to live. After the third day of continuous bombing, it suddenly stopped 
Mitzi was barking and eight-year-old Bobby ran into my room. I tried to quiet them both, but then remembered that the huge building that we were in was now empty, deserted, and no one could hear them. Rather, as Mitzi barked, it echoed into darkened halls, kitchens and abandoned bedrooms where only the remnants of people's lives remained. Mitzi ran to the window, so I did as well. It was 6 a.m. and I looked out the window and found the place surrounded by German troops. I grabbed my press pass, put the cord around my neck in case they came in. I was a journalist. They wouldn't harm me and my family, right? I thought my press pass was my warrior shield. A horrible fear crept over me and the eerie silence in the apartment in the whole building resonated. The only sound was the rolling of the trucks and guttural German commands. As I stood at the kitchen, I looked at the few cans we had left in the cupboard. Three stacks of cans, 10 or 12, maybe a bouillon cube that I had rustled up a few weeks before. Maybe we had enough for two weeks, three if we stretched it out. What would we do then? How long could this last? All the houses and buildings up and down the street were shuttered. Everyone seemed to have left. I had two sugar cookies left in a jar. They were yellow stars with pointed edges and a sprinkling of nuts and cinnamon just over the center. I think they were called Nuremberg cookies. How ironic to only have a German name cookie. I came to Paris because what I thought was the opportunity of a lifetime. I was hired by the International Herald Tribune to write about French food and fashion. Now my life was reduced to a few cans and a German cookie. How do I write about food and fashion? So I want to leave you with that and the thought that if we rise up, we can try to save the trees, the water, the children. And I want to thank Sherry Steiner and CTSB for this opportunity to share my work. Mm -hmm.